organizations. We're really about the science of how do you build more positive organizations. Our mission is to build um, research-based strategies for how we can help organizations and the people that are in them to become their very best. And our center has a, a, a really helpful website. And if you haven't had a chance to like, take a look at it, I would, because there's a number of resources there, including an archive of all the past positive link speech uh, talks. In addition, there's uh, tools, uh, there's cases, there is research articles. Take a look. And we encourage you to also follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and then you can get up to date um, announcements about things that are happening with the center. Uh, I'd like to give a special thanks to Diane and Paul Jones, who have been uh, wonderful supporters of the Center and Positive Links for a number of years. So please give them. Uh, so I'd like to turn now to make introductions to our speakers. Our first uh, of the pair, the dynamic duo, is Jerry Davis. Um, Jerry is one of our uh, faculty colleagues in the Management and Organizations Department. He's the author of a number of different books, including the book that they're going to be talking about today. Uh, he's the editor of the most prestigious academic journal in our field, Administrative Science Quarterly. And he's also the director of ICOS, the interdisciplinary um, consortium on organizational studies that many of us um, have gone to over a number of years. Uh, Jerry's research, um, as I said, has resulted in a number of books. His, his last book, entitled Managed by the Markets, How Finance Reshaped America, actually won the most prestigious award that the Academy of Management uh, gives out. And I'm very excited that in the next few weeks, his next book will be coming out with the very positive title the Vanishing American Corporation. <laughs> so definitely pre-order pre -order that one. Um, it'll be out in May. But the other half of the dynamic duo, you probably already know already, and that's our very own Chris White, who's the managing director of uh, the Center for Positive Organizations. He's originally from England, which will be very obvious when he starts talking in a moment. And he's been really leading and consulting uh, to purpose-driven organizations for many years. And it's kind of shocking when you realize that Chris um, just graduated from Ross in 2011 with his MBA. Now, the reason I mention that is it's really important to understand the genesis of where this book came from. Uh, so Jerry, as a first-year doctoral student, had the pretty ambitious goal of trying to map or um, index all the different social impact initiatives that were happening at the Ross School and the University of Michigan. And he started this process, and he was speaking to all these different thought leaders on campus who had interests in um, social impact. And one of those was Jerry Davis. And as the two of them started talking, lo and behold, one of the gaps they realized that uh, was occurring in how we think about um, social impact was there was no class on social intrapreneurship. So Chris said to Jerry, hey, let's create a course. And what most senior chaired professors do when an MBA suggests, hey, let's create a course, he said, sure. <laughs> and then they even went the next step to say, well, if we're going to teach the class, we might as well write a book. And then again, Jerry said, well, sure, let's do that. Um, so I hope it's clear to you what an unusual kind of partnership that the two of them have, have created. And they're going to share with you some of the most important insights. So please give them a, a warm welcome, Chris and Jerry. Thank you for the introduction. And I've got to say, it's like playing your home stadium here or something. This is great. Uh, and I want to say that this is actually a quite emotional session for me today because Jerry is uh, stepping away from uh, the teaching that we've been doing together and the writing that we're doing together in order to focus on a new class that he's developing. And I wanted to say thank you to Jerry for all of the mentorship and development and coaching and opportunities that our six-year collaboration has given. So thank you, Jerry.
And the next 46 minutes are about creating positive change uh, without authority. And so what I'd like to do as we get started into this is connect with you emotionally. Uh, what I want you to do is take a moment and think about a time when you tried to create positive change uh, without authority in a large, complex, bureaucratic organization. You got one? What are some of the feelings or emotions or words that come to your mind? Just free associate. Go ahead. Call it out. Frustration. Frustration. Overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. Let's take that. Energized. Excellent. You're in the right room. <laughs> one more. Novel. N novel. In the sense of being new, a new experience. Or surprised. Good. Or surprised. Lots of surprises everywhere. Unrealistic. Unrealistic. <laughs> OK, well, we've got 45 minutes to change that. Let's see how we do. <laughs> OK. I'd like you to take just a moment, and it's going to be a two-minute limit, so one minute per person. Be respectful to your colleague. Uh, and share that example briefly with the person sitting next to you. OK? So your two minutes start now. Okay, and wrap up your stories. So, for a lot of people, creating positive change. <laughs> Hello, friends. <laughs> Okay, we're going to bring it back here now. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's always a good sign when you start that exercise and that's the rest of the session. It really saves time on designing them. <laughs> I was a little worried that you guys wouldn't actually want to be inside on a day like today, but it turns out we're okay. And for a lot of people, creating positive change without authority is a lot like the little guy trying to lift the big weight. It just feels like you're trying to get it off the ground. And I'd like to share a couple of stories about trying to create positive change without authority. Uh, one that was really successful and one that was not. Uh, and then Jerry is going to walk through some of uh, the factors that we have found and theorized uh, make a difference in trying to create change without authority so we can reflect together on what the difference is between the two stories, okay? So let's start with a dismal failure. And there was a young or quite young uh, MBA student uh, who was working in a large pharmaceutical company. It happened to be me. 
I was working with this pharmaceutical company. I was working on a global access to medicine program, helping people uh, underserved with medicine to get access to, to drugs in developing countries in ways that were financially sustainable for the company. But while I was there on a fellowship, I thought, here's another opportunity to make a difference. Because you know the kitchenettes that they have in big uh, corporate offices that, that have coffee machines and water fountains and so on? On the wall of the kitchenette, there was a sign that said uh, how awful bottled water is for the world, for the environment. And I'm not saying this to make anyone feel guilty here. There's always a fair share of bottles in the room. Um, the crazy thing was that below this sign was a massive crate of bottled water. <laughs> and so I thought, OK, here's an opportunity to help this company make a change. And so I went to the vice president of the department and said, we, how about we get rid of bottled water? I'm an MBA student. I've done the maths. Uh, if we remove bottled water from this floor alone, it will save this much financially and this many bottles. If we remove it from the building, and this was a big building, uh, it would save this much. And if we removed it just in the New York offices, then it would save six figures a year if we added up all the people who worked there and made those assumptions. And she said yes. And I thought, this is great. I've got it figured out. Uh, and yet it failed miserably when it went to implementation. And so when you listen to Jerry's uh, story of the different factors involved, I want you to think about, OK, what aspects of uh, the story might have led to it coming unstuck? I'm sure you have some theories already. The second story, though. Uh, is about uh, our good friend Kevin Thompson, who actually lives just down the street from here uh, in uh, Dexter, Michigan. Actually, he's just moving into Ann Arbor now, I think. Um, so Kevin works at IBM. But before that, he had a, a really rich uh, history as uh, uh, performing in a ska band. So he would travel the world and perform. Uh, he was a Peace Corps alum as well. And so when he went uh, back for his MBA at Cornell, uh, he decided he wanted to make a career switch, ended up in IBM. Early on in his time, he was asked, what, what ideas do you have of how IBM can make more of an impact in the world? Kevin, based on his experiences, said, we should do a, a Peace Corps here at IBM. We should do a program to send IBM executives overseas for experience with nonprofits in developing countries, help them with, with their their work. And Kevin was pretty much laughed out of the room uh, from that first introduction. Intuitively, Big Blue was not a receptive place for uh, that kind of idea. And yet, fast forward a couple of years, and what became the Corporate Service Corps uh, became uh, one of the top 100 innovations in the first 100 years of IBM's history. And so it's been replicated in top com companies around the world. And um, one of the big factors that happened was that Sam Parmesano, uh, the chair of IBM, uh, announced the globally integrated enterprise where IBM needed to learn to be work, work better across the different countries in which it was involved. And so Kevin was able to, to ride that wave and other factors as well. And so. An idea that on paper seemed like a really good idea, financially and environmentally bombed. And an idea that on paper seemed counterintuitive or unlikely succeeded. Why would that be? So the last six years since that traumatic uh, experience in New York City uh, of trying to get an initiative to work and it failing, and those emotions that you expressed early on, in this session, I certainly felt all of those. Uh, the last six years have led to Jerry and I uh, working with many companies and organizations to uh, learn from some of the successful and unsuccessful entrepreneurs in those companies. Uh, we've looked at the underlying research, including from uh, our own Sue Ashford, who I think is over here, and Jane Dutton on issue selling, uh, as well as really drawing heavily from social movement theory and the work of Myers Old and others. Um, and looking at, is it the case that creating change in organizations is much like creating change in society, just with a different context? 
And so that's the metaphor that we're taking into the book and into this session today. So I'd like to ask Jerry to come up and share a little bit about what we found. All right, thank you. So there's a rhetorical question, what do these three organizations have in common? Uh, and it is a sampling on the dependent variable kind of a question. So Tanya, do you know? Good, okay. Cold calling people in a giant room is one of the cruelest things that a speaker can ever do, so you're gonna be off the hook for this one. So the, the answer to this one is that all three of them uh, were subject to social movements based in uh, social media. We're living in a time when it's possible for social media to aggregate attentions to start an instant movement around an organization uh, in a way that really wasn't possible before. Susan G. Komen for The Cure won Tuesday night on, in January. Uh, they announced in a very subtle way that they were cutting off funding to Planned Parenthood where they had funded breast cancer screening for low-income women. Within 48 hours, millions of tweets, Facebook dislikes, all over social media, people were saying, what the heck, we're never gonna support you again. How dare you cut off Planned Parenthood? And it was a, a phenomenon. It didn't have a leader. There was no Martin Luther King. There was no leader of this social movement. And yet the opinions got expressed strongly enough that by Friday morning, they had changed, uh, they had turned around, restored funding, and fired some top executives. So that's instance number one. Social media makes things transparent to people. Instance number two, Starbucks coffee. Uh, Starbucks has always supported whatever their local state law is on open carry, that is carrying weapons into the store openly. Uh, a bunch of Starbucks fans decided that they were gonna show up on August 18th for Starbucks Appreciation Day, where all of their heavily armed fans were gonna show up at Starbucks at the same time to share their appreciation with Starbucks management for supporting open carry. Starbucks does not see itself as being a social movement. They're a store, they serve coffee, they don't make legislation, they just want to follow the law. But because of this, including the protesters at Newtown, Connecticut, they decided we can't keep doing this. We're being dragged into politics that we really didn't feel that we had to. Wasn't anything that they particularly did, but suddenly they were dragged into political concerns that they hadn't really thought about. Third example, the Mozilla Corporation. They make the Firefox browser. They appointed a new CEO, and it became known among employees and outsiders that the CEO had given $1,000 to Proposition 8 in California against marriage equality. Some of the employees said, that's it, I'm not working here anymore. Uh, some of the customers that their browser was visiting said, we disagree with his political position. I wanna tell you, I'm an old person. Prior to 10 years ago, it would have been impossible to imagine that a CEO would be bothered by a contribution they made 10 years before, but now it was all over the media. Within two weeks, uh, he had to resign under pressure. This is a new time for everybody involved. Because of social media, there's a lot more transparency about what goes on in organizations. If you do it, people will find out. So if companies have policies that the public disagrees with, the public is gonna make its perceptions known. On the outside, it's much easier to form a social movement and call companies to account, for good or ill. I'm not taking a position on either side of any of these issues. I'm saying you can't ignore it anymore. This is the world that we live in. What I wanna talk about is how can we use this as change agents to our advantage? So, I realized I was supposed to start talking in an English accent and say governor and crikey so that my IQ would sound higher and I've already ruined things, sorry about that. Uh, but uh, the, the point of the book is that you can get at this by thinking like a social movement entrepreneur and we break it down because this is a business school into four simple questions uh, that you can ask in thinking about uh, making your change happen. Number one is why is this day different Kidding, that isn't the first question. First question is when. When is the right time to make a change? So I am gonna cold call someone and I warned him in advance. Randall, when was wheeled luggage invented? The day that the Flintstones arrived on the United States land. Exactly, it was the day that the Flintstones arrived. Wheeled luggage is the most obvious thing on earth and it's been here forever. When the first suitcase was invented, the next day somebody thought, let's put wheels on this. Wouldn't that make a lot of sense? All right, for those of us over 30, you may remember that no one had wheeled luggage. 
uh, it was impossible to imagine in 1972 a company actually got a patent on wheeled luggage. This seemingly totally obvious idea it took until 1972 for someone to patent it. They were putting it in all, all the Macy's trying to sell it and nobody bought it. It was a failure for 17 more years. The most obvious idea on earth didn't catch with people. It wasn't until the rollerboard was invented, marketed to travel crews, pilots, uh, and uh, pilots and um, and flight attendants rolling through the airport, and then normal people said, "Wait, pilots have wheels on luggage. Why don't we have this?" And then it took off. Now no one has luggage without wheels. It's impossible to imagine. Point is that. You'd think that a good idea like let's save money on plastic water bottles, it should take off instantly, but you need to be clever about the timing. So what are some of the factors that signal the openness to new ideas in an organization? What are the opportunity signals? The first one is changes in the competitive context or strategy. What's going on in the broader environment and within the company's strategy? If you're someone without authority and all of a sudden Uber is doing to your industry what it's done to everyone else, that could be a signal of opportunity. So changes in the strategic context, changes in the company strategy. A second and really important one is changes in the political system or the leadership. The appearance of a new CEO with a new set of priorities can be a good moment if you have an idea for making a change. Uh, in the local economy, my favorite example would be Bill Ford at Ford. Uh, when he took over the company, he was an avowed environmentalist. At the time, the company was minting money with monster SUVs that got 10, mile, 10 gallons per mile. I don't know if you remember the excursion, but wouldn't actually fit on most roads in the world. That was a way that Ford uh, made money. When Bill Ford became CEO, though, it signaled that there was going to be support at the top for all kinds of initiatives, not just environmental, but throughout the company, including human rights issues. So change at the top uh, is a second thing. A third thing is a burning platform, which is the issue is being forced on us. So imagine that you have a new building coming in. A hundred something million dollars is going into that building. What is the right time to pitch the idea that we should be LEED certified platinum? Not just silver, not just gold, but LEED certified platinum. The fact that the building is going up means it's got to be now or never. Uh, that's the burning platform idea. So first question is when. The second question is why. And this is really about framing. What do you have to say to people to get them to think that your idea, a corporate Peace Corps or what have you, uh, is a good idea. And this is about framing. How do you state your case in a way that people find naturally appealing? Okay, this is a university context. So I need to give you what's called a trigger warning <laughs> about the next slide. This is going to be vegetarian propaganda. <laughs> and so if you eat red meat, I think you should look down and ignore this next slide, okay? You've been warned, right? All right. Oops, so compare and contrast frames. Uh, who's heard of pink slime? Everyone has heard of pink slime. What is pink slime? It's such a disgust, you don't even wanna go further than the name pink slime. You hear that word and you never wanna encounter this stuff. So in the industry's parlance, it's called lean, finely textured beef. And when you hear the words lean, finely textured beef, you think of something like this. A burger, something delicious, nutritious, full of protein, good for growing bodies. When you hear the word pink slime, you might think something like this. It actually looks like strawberry frozen yogurt, um, but this is what pink slime is. It's basically all of the stuff that ends up on the floor of the slaughterhouse, then you spray it. Oh, sorry. How about them Lakers? I'm not going to tell you what pink slime is. I will tell you that this word alone was sufficient to kill the industry. Just to use, we'll move on. Just to use the word pink slime to describe what was being put as excess meat into burgers, that was enough to kill an entire industry segment. Uh, you can call to mind alternatives like this. Uh, what about end of life planning? Advanced end of life planning where you think through what your directives are gonna be. Doesn't that sound sensible and lawyery and like all grown-ups should do some advanced end of life planning? But if you call it, Marvin, 
death panels, that kills it immediately. Death panels does not get you the traction that thoughtful end of life planning does. It is, I'm willing to say, it's a good idea to plan things in advance when you're not rushed, just sitting down with someone. That's a pretty good idea. It's not going to happen, at least not funded by the US government. So what elements go into making a compelling case? We talk about three flavors of framing, and the first one is to have a master frame, the one overall narrative that holds your initiative together. So the master frame might be something like, make America great again. <laughs> that, is, that is such a good frame. If you put that on a baseball hat, people will wear that hat around in front of their frames. Old people will remember that Ronald Reagan had used that same phrase in 1980, but whatever, originality is for losers. Make America, <laughs> this will be huge. So the master frame is make America great again. It's a diagnosis, but with more specific examples with different constituencies. The adapted frame is how do you take that idea and pitch it to different people out there in the world? When you're talking to different groups, donor groups, different flavors of voters, when you're trying to pitch your idea with the company, marketing, operations, your boss, they're gonna wanna hear different things. So you have the master frame, but you adapt it uh, to different constituencies. And then the evolving frame. This is the idea that maybe you didn't get it right the first time. Corporate Peace Corps is a good idea, but it had some pretty rough edges to it. So can, people are gonna have good ideas that you can evolve over time. Take your frame and adapt it to what you're hearing from people. Be open to ideas so that it will ultimately be more compelling. So that's the second one, that's the why. The third is the who, uh, and this is about networks. All right, if you're not from the United States, our norms about gender binaries require that boys be represented by blue, girls be represented by pink. And this network is who dates whom in an Ohio high school. I just want you to observe this beautiful diagram for a while and think back to your own high school days. <laughs> These are all of the people that dated each other in this uh, largest connected cluster. Uh, I look at this and I instantly start having questions. First off, this is what the high school lunchroom looks like in dating terms. You've got sort of the sports characters over here, you've got the uh, dope smokers over here, these might be the musicians and these might be the nerds, I don't know. And then you've got people like me, we're off here by ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> You don't put those of us up here. And I realized that Gretchen went to high school in Ohio, and so, I don't know, this Bowling Green, who can say really? I love, and, and you wonder, who is that guy? <laughs> it turns out that there are uh, mathematical techniques for analyzing people like that. This person is what we in the social network analysis world call a playa, um, <laughs> which, or otherwise, someone with high eigenvector centrality. So this is someone that turns up really well in the, in the Google rank search. And then there's sullen loners off here, and you'll notice that this is one of the most heterosexual high schools on earth, apparently. It's Ohio, it's, it's interesting. So you can analyze this to try to understand what the influence structure looks like within an organization. And the point is, if you know the networks, you can pull out the key people that are gonna be especially useful allies for your initiative. It's not just that you take your idea to that immediate boss and pitch it to them. You figure out who are the key decision makers, what is the shortest path to get to them, what are the interests of those people along the way. There's particular characters that are especially useful for this. So the starting point is that you have the decision maker, but you wanna know about the influence system around them. Who are the people that they listen to? Whom do they go to for advice? Those are the people that you ultimately wanna persuade. You don't go straight to the CEO with your list of demands. Uh, you influence those around uh, that core decision maker. And what kind of people do you look for? Here we shamelessly crib from Malcolm Gladwell, admittedly, uh, from the tipping point. But you can actually use network analysis to figure out who are the mavens, who are the people that others go to for advice, the information specialists that people find really persuasive because 
They pay attention, they gather information, they analyze, they are trustworthy. So you can identify the mavens. Who are the players? Who are the connectors that are well connected across the organization that can put you on the shortest path to decision makers? Oops. And the last thing is, what do you do with the resistors? There are some people that are gonna hate your idea for one reason or another. Do you go after them last after everyone else has already been persuaded, or do you try to make an example of them? Do you try to persuade the most skeptical person to go along with you? There's not one right or wrong answer, but those are the kind of questions uh, you'd wanna think through here. The last question is about how. Uh, how do you make this whole mess work? This is planning a journey. <laughs> what do we got here? We have uh, seven people on uh, one motorcycle here. Um, what, what constitutes a sensible solution in your organization? So it's not the case that all ideas work equally well everywhere. How do you customize it for your particular setting? Uh, this is something that makes sense in Ann Arbor and not elsewhere. It's a bus that, as far as I know, doesn't actually move but does house people who want to drink around sporting events. So that's a solution that makes perfect sense in Ann Arbor, maybe not elsewhere. Um, so can you point to precedent? Are there previous programs that have looked a lot like this that you can use as an analogy? Can you actually build on that same, uh, that same framework? So if you've already got affinity groups and you want to start an affinity group for uh, transgender people, rely on precedent. Make it look like something like that. Second one is don't start big. Don't go with, and next year we're gonna have 100,000 participants. Uh, start with a pilot. And there's some good political reasons for calling something uh, a pilot. So this is a secret that can't leave this room. Um, so you know, in, in the, the MBA program, one of our signature aspects is MAP, the Multidisciplinary Action Project, where people go off around the world for seven weeks to do consulting uh, with, with different organizations. So the MAP project is a great signature action-based learning. It's really central to who we are. But technically, when they created this 26 years ago, they said, and this is a pilot we'll revisit two years later. Now, by all historical reports, they never actually revisited this. It's now on year 27, and we have yet to revisit this pilot. Technically, MAP is still a pilot program at the Ross School of Business, so it could be in danger, uh, but I don't sense so. So you don't get the opposition with pilot programs. It's also the case that in the corporate world, people come and go, and uh, if there's people that oppose your program and you call it a pilot, odds are good that in six months or at most 12 months, they'll be in a different role, and now it'll just be taken for granted that it's been there forever. And I think that must have been what happened with the MAP program. An internet blog, can you use electronic technologies to connect with people? Uh, and I think that'll be evident to people how you might pull this off. At IBM, it turns out that if you post something on the internet and say, uh, I have this great idea for a corporate Peace Corps, and 5,000 people click like, that's gonna be seen as a pretty credible sign that your idea has some real support out there. Uh, I'll hand it off back to Chris, who will put on that fake accent. <laughs> so as you think about the four factors that Jerry just described, and think about the two stories that we shared at the start. So uh, Kevin Thompson's initiative to create a corporate service corps at IBM, and my initiative to get rid of bottled water at a pharmaceutical company. Do the four factors hold up? Let's think. So in terms of when, with Kevin, the idea initially was laughed out of the room. Sam Parmesano announced a globally integrated enterprise in Foreign Policy magazine, and all of a sudden there was a call for programs that supported that uh, strategy, that strategic direction, that could also be visible externally. So all of a sudden, an idea that was bad timing, wasn't strategically aligned, became much more center to uh, where the company was going overall um, in, in what they were doing. And in terms of the water bottles, I mean, it was a good idea, but there was really no burning platform around this. Everyone in organizations, or many people in organizations, are very, very busy, especially decision makers. There was nothing really compelling about what I was proposing that forced this to the top of people's agendas to make this change. Think about the why as well. 
So the case that Kevin was making for Corporate Service Corps started off as being a philanthropic idea, a, a, a community a corporate social responsibility play. By the time it had uh, been approved and reached scale, it had evolved to be a talent development play, uh, especially in the time of budget crunches. This was in 2008, by the way, uh, which was not the best time to be start, starting new philanthropic activities uh, in large companies. Uh, but Kevin was able to position this as a more cost-effective way of developing leadership talent than some of the existing expat programs that were being run with the same outcomes that he tracked. In terms of the why of the bottled water, uh, it made sense financially, it made sense environmentally, but what I ran into was culture there, that it wasn't enough to create behavior change for people. Think of all the good ideas that you've heard, all the good information that you've heard. What was the last thing that you learned, new information, that led to a sustained change in your behavior? For many people to whom I ask that question, it can be months or years uh, since they learned something like that. And so the bar is quite high to influence in people to change behavior. And then in terms of the who, uh, Kevin had uh, a beautiful sandwich there of support by the time this was approved. Sam Parmesano uh, very publicly supporting this initiative, uh, but also a grassroots support for his initiative. Kevin wrote a blog on the IBM intranet announcing the Corporate Service Corps and inviting people to apply. That blog ended up being the most shared blog in IBM that whole year, ahead of promotions, ahead of um, product launches and everything. Uh, and so that gave him some evidence to say, there's real interest here. This could be something we need to look into. Um, and in terms of my initiative, I had the support of the, the vice president but I didn't get the support of the people around her. And so people viewed this as something that was being imposed on them as opposed to something they were choosing to step into and wanted to support. And then finally on the how, Kevin was one of the people we learned from in terms of pilots there. He did not try and create a huge program initially. He created a small cohort that went. He partnered with people who knew what they were doing in terms of international programs like this. Uh, so there was a mobilizing structure that made sense to decision makers when they were signing off on it. It was a low risk move to test out. In terms of my idea, unfortunately I probably didn't have a mobilizing structure. The last, the last six years have been quite educational for me. Uh, and so the mobilizing structure of try this, do this differently doesn't work. There needs to be a sustained uh, program to roll out new initiatives. And so with the benefit of those four factors, and I'm sure there are others uh, there as well, you can at least start to see the difference between an initiative that seemed on paper like it was a good idea um, and why that was unsuccessful and an initiative that actually seemed like it probably shouldn't have worked but did kick in. And it turns out that these kinds of initiatives and the initiatives that you're leading are really important for the world. The Ross School of Business, as many of you know, uh, have adopted a position in the world of uh, positive business. The idea that we can create uh, economic value, we can create great workplaces, and we can be good neighbors as well to our communities and to the environment. And those things don't have to be mutually exclusive. And some of those decisions are made at the very tops of organizations, but many of them are made by the day-to-day -day work of people in the middle of the pack. Uh, who are trying to create positive change without authority. And it's the kind of things that we can make a difference in. Those bottle, bottles of water that I <laughs> talked about, there's actually 28 billion plastic bottles in landfills in the US alone. I think we need a different relationship to uh, our stuff and how it's made and how we use it to be sustainable. Uh, and we need people who will be entrepreneurs to come up with those new products and those new mechanisms to be more sustainable. 150 million uh, people are child laborers working in sweatshops around the world. So we need a different relationship to our supply chains and policies 
uh, uh, of working with labor around the world as well. That too is the work of entrepreneurs like Dave Burdish at Ford, uh, who we've had into our class uh, regularly, who helped develop a code of human rights. I'd argue, and I am as addicted as anyone, uh, that we need a different relationship to our technology as well. And so 11 hours a day, we are connected to digital media on average in the United States, which of course has a knock-on effect of productivity in some ways, but also a knock-on effect to our consciousness, probably, uh, to our relationships with others, our relationships with our family. And so we need entrepreneurs that can seize the benefits of that technology there, uh, but also limit some of the impact it's having on our social fabric. Who will those people be? And finally, 13% uh, of the world's population is, or sorry, 13% of the US workforce is actively engaged in the work that they do every day. <clears throat> so we need entrepreneurs and we need people like the folks uh, connected with the Center for Positive Organizations, I would hope. This is part of our mission, uh, to build organizations where people are engaged and where people can create value for the world and where they can thrive at the same time. So we need entrepreneurs to change some of those practices. And we hope that those entrepreneurs are you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, creating a positive difference in the world. So we have about seven or eight minutes uh, for questions, if anyone would like to ask as well. Uh, and then we'll wrap up for this beautiful evening. Please. With that 13% engaged, do you mean only 13% of people are really excited about their work? Is that what you meant? Uh, it's from the Gallup study where uh, they break it down into actively engaged, uh, engaged, and uh, disengaged, and actively disengaged. Uh, and so the actively engaged are self-starters, they're pursuing their work um, eagerly, uh, and the opposite end, it's the people who are actively working, not, not just not doing their work, but actively working against their company. You Randy. Emotion, you know, you brought that up earlier about mm. emotion and connection. You know, as far as emotion goes, that 13% of the people that are engaged with what the work is, what does that look like for the other group that is? Would you like to? No, that's, that? that's your question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thoroughly engaged. I'm pumped up. So Angie will remind me that I should repeat the question back. And so if I'm understanding it right, Randy, and feel free to Please. clarify. Uh, so the 13% may be emotionally connected to their work, and you're theorizing yeah, that the, other the others may not. Yeah, um, one of the pieces of work that I've loved learning about in the last four years with the center is the, the work that uh, people like Jane Dutton have done around meaning and purpose and work, and Amy Rosniewski, who's now at, at Yale. Um, and so uh, the center at the moment is going through a busy, uh, intense time of strategic um, alignment, really, I guess. And so as we're making big pushes on things, we're trying to match that with infusing purpose and meaning in, in work. So every staff meeting on Wednesday, we bring in someone who uh, we feel has benefited from the work that we're doing to share their story with all the staff. And so for every additional ask that we make of people, we're trying to also um, help people remember why we're doing it. And so I, I, my hunch is that those 13% uh, in many cases will be intrinsically motivated uh, self-motivated um, from the work that they're doing um, and that some of the others could be shifted over by more deliberate strategies to connect purpose and meaning to their work. And going back 30 years ago, what would that have looked like, that 13%? Higher I actually lower? don't know. I don't, the question was, uh, was, was the 13% higher or lower 30 years ago? I know it hasn't changed much in recent years, but maybe uh, uh, some of the other uh, faculty in the room might know. Thank you. Gretchen. I was just going to say, um, come back next month because we're going to have uh, our dean, Allison Davis-Blake, talk about 
her work in transforming the Ross School of Business around this vision of positive business. And so I think she'll have some really practical insights on how she's tried to do that here. It's a, it's a great question, and obviously it's not an easy one to answer since that number's been pretty sticky around 13%. Please. I was wondering, are there certain steps that you can take to repair your reputation if you have a lot of people resistant to your idea? <laughs> Fortunately, I finished my fellowship soon afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> the question was, uh, are there steps that you can take to repair your reputation with people who are resistant to your idea? Yeah, so part of the thing that we've discovered with uh, the various folks, the uh, various entrepreneurs that we've spoken with is uh, if you show up on day two after your MBA and say, I have 50 ways to make this company better, you will not win friends. <laughs> it's very important that people start to build relationships uh, with other folks. If you've built up a reputation and a set of relationships with the people you're working with, you're going to get a lot of idiosyncrasy credit. So if you propose something that doesn't fly, that's not going to be held against you. If you show up as the change agent from outside, that's not going to fly very well. You really need to know the way the place works to understand the business case that you're trying to make, uh, and that should do the trick. So. Yeah. I would, if it's okay, I'd like to add one, one thing to it, which was that um, I've been doing a further set of interviews um, very gradually uh, to try and understand who are these people mm -hmm. uh, at an identity kind of level. And one of the things that keeps recurring is their resilience. As all mm -hmm. of us know, and I think it came across in the comments that people shared early on uh, in this session, that we all get dinged. Uh, it's normal for organizations uh, to occasionally push back on people trying to create change, and that can take a personal toll uh, when you're trying to create change. And um, the best entrepreneurs that I've spoken with are those who internalize that not as a bad thing, but that there's some exciting tension in the system around this. So it's not about them, it's about the system. And so trying to sustain ourselves during those is, is important. So we have time for a couple more. Yeah, so I'm thinking about it depends on what the nature of the initiative that you're trying to pitch is. Uh, one of the ones that I learned about earliest on uh, meeting entrepreneurs when I lived in New York was trying to pitch the idea of domestic partner benefits for LGBT employees. And that, that's a really complicated one because not everybody necessarily wants to be identified. Building a movement can be really complex there. But if you can document to management, there's a lot of people that are going to be affected by this. After you've got a groundswell of support, maybe not really visible, but visible to management, uh, that can make a difference. But it's going to depend on what the initiative is. The plastic bo water bottles, I'm not sure that anything you did was going to get employees at this unnamed company to rise up and say, yay, get rid of the plastic water bottles. Might have been one that just wasn't going to fly. Other things, though, if you can show a base of support, Management is thinking we need to be able to recruit people in the future. And one of the bits of leverage that people have is, is this something that's going to appeal to millennials? <laughs> uh, and that's a case that seems to trump, uh, that's a case that seems to work, <laughs> that seems to work in a surprising number of contexts and why you see certain kinds of firms in the vanguard of adapting social innovations is they need to be able to recruit young people with talent. And uh, I just had one slight part to it, which was actually that um, we've added the thought of the evolving frame mm. since we wrote the book. And that is really the, that we realized about the, all the conversations we've had with entrepreneurs. Mm. Very few of them are getting to yes, no decision meetings. Mm. They're almost always building support, building support, mm. and incorporating people's ideas. Uh, and so they very rarely seem to go into a meeting for a decision. It's always building. because it's such a great one. But we have a special gift for the two of you. It's a positive spiral because today I think you've created a real positive spiral of people who are going to take your ideas and run with it. So let's give them one more round of applause. Good job. I, I also want
want to give a big thank you to the uh, center staff, especially Angie Seeley in the back, who has been working very hard to get today organized. Um, and another thank you to all of the uh, staff who have been helping with the live streaming today. So thank you very much. I also alluded to the fact that our last session of the academic year is going to be a very special one, too, with our Dean, Allison Davis-Blake, coming um, to talk with us on April 13th, so less than a month away. The title of her talk is Organizational Miracles, the Role of Positive Organizing in Recovery from Crisis. So please come back and join us. If you had more questions, I think Chris and Jerry will be up here for a few minutes, and there's... Uh, a reception afterward, please join us for that. Thank you and enjoy this beautiful evening. Good job.